Hey guys, I'm Jerry Mitchell, like, and you know, we're going on the road 150, 200 days a year shooting competitions and doing all kind of business related stuff and uh, we're kind of running out of topics on what to do with videos and, and stuff that's exciting and uh, so we're going to kind of cop out on you a little bit here and <laughs> make you a cheap video. It's going to be a clickbait video, guys. It's going to be the top five guns that I like that are not Smith & Wesson. So what do you think? You want to see one? You know, guys, we've all seen these kind of these kind of videos with the top five, like the top five laxatives, and you're not going to believe what number two is. But anyway, coming in at number five is this 2011 STI uh, 45 ACP semi-automatic pistol. And what you can tell by the quick look on it, uh, it looks kind of long, and it is. What I was trying to simulate here was the sight radius that was going to be exactly the same as an eight and three eight inch Model 27 revolver. That's what I was using to shoot bowling pins at the time. Back when second chance bowling pin match was a big thing, uh, bowling pins was all the rage. I, I shot a model 27 Smith & Wesson revolver, but I wanted to try my hand at a semi-automatic pistol. And this was built in collaboration with my father-in-law, Jim Clark Sr. He was the founder of Clark Custom Guns, uh, bullseye champion, had 71 career records in his lifetime. He's the only civilian to ever win Camp Perry championships overall in 1958. So an interesting fellow to say the least. So I wanted to make something big and ugly, and so Jim and I got together and we came up with this. And uh, you can tell by the uh, compensator in the front, it was set up to shoot real, real heavy loads, and uh, it worked extremely well. Matter of fact, I took it a second chance, I want to say somewhere in the mid-90s, and uh, shooting my five-pin event, and that's five bowling pins on a table. Anyway, on my very last set of pins, I had a new record going, and I, had, I also owned the previous record of 15.1 seconds. So with this pistol, I was on my way to set a new record, and I had Jim Clark behind me there. I was gonna, I was gonna do it. Had a malfunction. <laughs> so, needless to say, it took my first place glory out, and I think I finished second or third. But anyway, when I look at this, I think of Jim, and uh, so it's got some fond memories there. So something that Jim and I built. And in number four place is this old beat up German 98 Mauser. Of course, it's an 8x57 Mauser. I picked this up at uh, a gun show in Houston. The Houston gun show was huge. I walked through there, I had uh, $150 burning a hole in my pocket, so I came across this rifle. I think I picked it up somewhere in, in the early 80s. Uh, it's a wartime production. It's a 1941 manufacturer. It's got the plywood stock. Other than that, it's strictly you know, standard issue 98 Mauser. But what's really outstanding about this thing, guys, when I had bought it, I also found a deal on some ammunition. I bought, uh, I think, 35,000 rounds of non-corrosive heavy ball, which is 198 grain uh, FMJ ammunition at the same time. So I had this thing, I had a bunch of ammo. I altered the front sight, made it a little bit thinner, and everywhere I went, I took this rifle and I did a lot of offhand shooting. I shot the barrel out of it. It still looks like a rifle, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't shoot too much like a rifle anymore. But I put a lot of rounds through it. It's been a, a go-to gun. Uh, it's probably taught me more about marksmanship and offhand shooting than any other fire on my own. And it was relatively cheap to shoot, so six cents a round was cheaper than reloading at the time. And uh, what can you say, it's, it's 98 all the way through, so it got a lot of respect. And when you shoot this thing, you realize that our copy of the 03 Springfield was, dry, was a direct copy of the 98 miles or so. As a matter of fact, we had the United States government had to pay royalty to the Germans uh, for the patent infringements on that. But, Anyway, it's just a classic to me when I see it. Uh, it's been on a lot, of, a lot of adventures. So there it is, guys, 98 Mauser. And in number three spot, I have a Colt H-Bar right here. I bought this in the early 80s. I want to say around 19, I mean, yeah, about 1980. And I bought it to go to the Soldier Fortune three-gun match. And at the time, the SOF matches were the only three-gun events in the United States. So I never had an AR platform before. I had many 14s, I had bolt action rifles, I had 03 Springfields, I uh, had M1As, but the, uh, the AR concept was kind of new to me. So when I bought this, this was an introduction to the, uh, to the modern era for me. Uh, plastic, it did, doesn't really look like a gun, and what I read about it, you gotta remember I was born in an era of uh, blued steel and walnut, so having a synthetic stock, and uh, it looks like a BB gun. So, but anyway, the more I shot it, the more I appreciated it, and I really realized uh, the ARs had a lot of, a lot of potential. So, And to shoot the Soldier of Fortune 
a vent. I had to use metallic sights, and back then I could actually see metallic sights. And you can see it's pretty much stock. Uh, it's even stock to the trigger. Back then, there wasn't much trigger modifications to be had on AR platforms. So we shot them the way they were. And I shot this up until about the mid 80s, uh, late 80s, and then uh, Soldier Fortune uh, allowed us to use optics. So, but anyway, that was my introduction to the AR platform. Uh, like I said, it's a Colt uh, H bar A2, and uh, it's been a good it's been a good uh, performer. So, Colt all the way through. And in the second place, I have an Iva Johnson Arms and Cycle Works five-shot 38 Smith & Wesson revolver. And you're thinking, well, that's a pretty dinky little gun. But it is. Back, but you have to remember, this belonged to my grandfather. and it, uh, He was raised on a little 100-acre farm there in Texas, and this was his big gun. And when I was a kid, when we'd, when we'd go visit him, this was what I wanted to look at. This was my introduction to a centerfire handgun. And when you, back when you were about six, seven years old, this thing looked like a massive 44 Magnum. But uh, that was his big gun. And what's interesting about it, it was nickel, uh, but it was pretty rusty. So when I got possession of it after he passed away, I just re, uh, refinished it. Uh, but I also have something pretty neat here, guys. Some original cartridges that he had. These are UMC manufactured black powder 38 Smith and, 30, <laughs> 38 Smith and Wesson cartridges. And what was interesting about this box of ammunition is that it's got three and a half cents written on it. So Back in the day when you had a handgun like this, when you went to the country store, if you shot your revolver once or twice, nobody bought a whole box of ammunition. You went to the store and you bought maybe one or two rounds to, uh, to replenish what you had in the cylinder. So it was very common back then to buy your cartridges individually. Uh, money was uh, scarce back, back in those days. So it makes you appreciate uh, the time and place that this was manufactured and also what it was used for. So there it is, guys. Ivor Johnson, Arm and Cycle Works Revolver. And in number one spot, guys, we have the famous Remington Nylon 66. This is my original Nylon 66 I bought hmm, oh, way back. This was my first firearm that I ever owned. And the way I acquired this uh, Nylon 66, I had a chance to work with my great uncle there in Texas. He had a little country meat market slaughterhouse. And I spent a week with him shooting sparrows and pigeons off of his slaughterhouse while he was in there working. I was out there shooting birds for him, cleaning up his place. And uh, I stayed a week with him. He flipped me a $20 bill. And I think this thing was $44 and some odd cents. I remember paying cash for it. Uh, had to cut a lot of yards and kill a lot of sparrows to, uh, <laughs> to get this nylon 66. But to give you an idea, when I was coming up, all the gun magazines had advertisements uh, for the nylon 66s, but was, what was interesting to me was there was an old boy by the name of Tom Fry. He's in the Skeet Shooting Hall of Fame, and he worked for Remington at the time. Back in 1959, he shot a record 104,000 aerial two and a half inch wooden blocks, hand thrown, in 13 days, eight hours a day, three rifles, quite an accomplishment. He only had six misses in all that uh, shooting, and I'm sure he didn't have one malfunction. So. This one I've put a lot of ammunition through. I can say it, it has honestly never jammed. The only time it ever did jam, I had it underwater in the bottom of my P-Rog and uh, it got full of debris so much that the bolt wouldn't close and it blew the head off and it, the extractor left. But other than that, that was my fault. But uh, what's ingenious about the actual design of this, uh, this rifle, if you look at the actual uh, magazine tube, it's almost directly in line with the bore. So. The cartridge is going into the chamber when you pull the bolt back and it gives it a feed cycle. The round jumps almost completely into the chamber, so it's hard to, hard to actually make it jam. And I've actually shot this thing underwater probably as much as I have shot it on top of the water. Uh, and what was nice about it, you could come back and hose it off, hang it on a clothesline, spray a little WD-40 on it. Next day, uh, take it out, hit the swamp again. So it's one of those 22s that... Uh, the end of time kind of a thing you want to have in your, in your go-to bag. I don't think there was anything ever manufactured that could, could actually compete with the reliability of the uh, Nylon 66, also the weight. The downside of this whole gun, and I've, I've shot it a tremendous amount of ammunition through them, is that the, the composite stock here, these little plastic stocks are kind of cheeky and they have a tendency to bend. So I accurized mine. I bought another one secondhand, and I put a pistol scope on the front of it. And as you can see, the scope is actually attached to the barrel. I made a set of mounts 
and uh, this negated the uh, the flex in the stock same reliable action and uh, put a little Tasco pistol scope on it so I was before Jeff Cooper there doing this kind of stuff so shot a lot of neutrals with it a lot of snakes it's just a uh, also has one of the Remington original nylon 66 factory slings guy this is kind of rare I think I paid like five dollars and fifty cents for that back in the day but anyway nylon 66 they're kind of a collector's item now and I don't really I really can't say how many rounds I've shot through one. It's been a tremendous amount of ammunition through one. So there it is, guys. Number one, Non Smith and Wesson, Nylon 66. Okay, guys, I'd like for you to subscribe and like us on Facebook. And also in the comments below, kind of keep us posted on what you think about a video like this. And uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. But I don't know about you, but I'm going to go shoot.